Good evening, everyone, and welcome. I'm Matthew McClendon. I'm the J. Sanford Miller Family Director of the Fralin Museum of Art, and I am so pleased that you can join us tonight for the third in a series of panel discussions with UVA alumni who are now working in museums and the wider world of the arts. These discussions have been a way during these times when all programming has had to go virtual for us to connect with our alumni and our wider audiences. In particular, these discussions have been framed with our current UVA students first in our minds as they are exploring their own interests in the arts and possible career paths moving forward. Tonight, I'm pleased to see that we have a large number of students joining us live and the conversation may tend a bit more toward career pathways than our previous two evenings. We also have um, no offense to previous alumni that we've talked with, younger, more recent alumni um, whose career paths are very fresh in their minds. Um, I, before we begin, I must say thank you to our volunteer board of the museum who has generously supported this series. Just a reminder, if you do have questions, we're using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. You can find it there. I'll be monitoring the Q&A um, during the during the discussion and if there are some questions that organically flow in I'll, I'll try and get those in during the discussion but we'll certainly leave time at the end of the evening um, for some questions from our audience uh, one last thing the conversation is being recorded and will be available on our youtube page in the coming days with that i am so honored to be joined this evening uh, by Calvin Harvey, who is Vice President uh, and Old Master Painting Specialist at Sotheby's, Wright Harvey, who is Founder and President Sugarlift LLC, and Charlotte Miller Russell, who is Owner and Curator of Charlotte Russell Contemporary. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Um, we're going to dive right in. There's so much to talk about in the worlds of the gallery and the auction house, which we have represented um, tonight. And I think that knowing that we have so many students that are on tonight and will be watching these um, later that we really, they are really interested. And I've, I've heard from a number of them that they really like when we talk about the pathways, how you've come to be where you are today. Um, that, that kind of what, what at UVA, your time at UVA led you to your roles today. So Calvin, let's, let's start with you. Did your interest in working with old masters and the auction house begin at UVA? Um, when and how did that begin? And how did you get to Sotheby's? Um, you know, it did. And I, I will say that I think I've got the Fralin to thank for that, um, thank which is you. wonderful. Thank you, Calvin, thank you. <laughs> Just put in a plug right away. Right. Um, <laughs> I was, um, a double major in studio art and history. Um, so I actually wasn't an art history major, um, but I studied printmaking. Um, and one of my uh, absolute favorite memories and the moment that I think of is when I, I found this path was when our print class, Dean Das and Akemi O'Hara would take us to the Freyland print study room. Um, and we would get to look at the Durer prints Rembrandt prints, Goya etchings. I mean, just unbelievable. And getting to see those in real life um, really woke me up to old masters, to the power of that art. I loved the idea that they were using the same techniques that I was using in my studio art classes at the time. And um, it was something that I really um, held on to. Um, but that being said, I was also, um, studying at the School of Education. And I had planned on um, leaving and doing an arts education career was sort of my hope, I have to say. You know, if you had asked me when I was um, a student there, that's what I would have said. Um, but I ended up, when I first graduated from college, it was 2008, and you know, the world was sort of crashing around me. Um, Charlotte graduated the same year, maybe of a similar story. <laughs> um, <laughs> same story. <laughs> Um, so all those great museum jobs, you know, were being completely slashed, and it was just not even not even a question. Um, but I did see an advertisement for an old master print gallery, um, and I was thrilled, um, so excited, and so I applied, and I worked there for a few years. Um, it was David Tunick was a was the owner of the gallery, um, and then from there I shifted to Sotheby's, and then 
shifted into paintings and I've been there for over 10 years now. So that's sort of a brief summary, but, but I will go back to that print study room and, uh, <laughs> and when I got to see those prints firsthand. Yeah, I love that. That's music to my ears. I'm going to take you on the road with me and just have you give that, <laughs> give that talk over and over because that is the greatest testament I think I've heard to what we try and do at the Fralin. And it's the greatest testament to the power of museums, um, which is, the, you know, the object and the stories, not just the object themselves, but the people that made the object, the stories behind the objects. Um, which can be both good and bad. And we're exploring that certainly more in the museum uh, world today as well. But I think that's what we see with so many of our students and exactly what we wanna see. And Akimi and Dean are just both fantastic and have always brought students and really um, worked with the collection. Uh, Larry Getty is another one. I don't know if Larry's on tonight, but frequently students cite his uh, courses looking at prints um, as really sparking their interest. I'm, I'm, curious um, because you were studying, you were dual and studying education. So I think it's really important, um, particularly for our students on tonight and in the future, um, that you didn't, you weren't necessarily studying art history, which I think a lot of times people think is the, re the requisite um, to go into the gallery or the museum or, or the auction house. I'd love to hear a little bit about how, you know, those education, the, the experiences in your education work and studies have helped you in your career? Um, you know, I will say that one of the first questions I get asked when I tell people what my job is as an old master specialist is, oh, were you an art history major? Right. <laughs> and I sort of have to decide how long I want the conversation to go, <laughs> so whether I launch into this whole story. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, I think I, I absolutely love my time at the education school and the people I met. It kept me in Charlottesville longer. Um, I actually, because I stayed and I did that, um, I did an extra semester where I was a student teacher at a local school, um, which was just wonderful up in Crozet. Um, but at the same time, I actually worked at the museum with the student docents that semester. Um, so it, it, again, brought me even closer um, to the world that I'm in right now. And I think, um, you know, ultimately, all everything that you learn at UVA and the, and the breadth of the courses that you have learning about writing, about organizing, about teaching. You know, I, I do a lot of writing now um, in the research and cataloging that we do for all of our sales. Um, and I definitely look back to my time at UVA um, and think about that often. Yeah, that's wonderful. Um, I think, you know, one of the things I often talk about with students is that whatever aspect of the arts you go into, or if you're going to whatever job you have in the museum, you're always you're always called on to be educating people. So that that kind of you know uh, experience that you gain either through being an ed education major or being a student docent, which is also fa a fantastic way at um, introducing yourself to some of those skills. You find that particularly you know when I come to Sotheby's. Um, and other auction houses that shall remain nameless. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, you know, it's it's always an education. The specialists are always educating me as a museum director um, because there's Absolutely. just a vast body of of knowledge, and we really we really depend on that. So I can I think that's a wonderful part of your story that I hope I hope our students are hearing. Um, so moving moving to the the other world, and I guess I should point out for those who haven't noticed. Um, Wright and Calvin do share a last name, and there is there is a reason <laughs> for that, even though they are in separate spaces. Uh, Wright's in his gallery, and Calvin, I, I'm assuming you're at home. Um, <laughs> and you, both, you met at UVA, didn't you? We did. We met. Um, I have to say, I was laughing earlier about having met Charlotte like my first week at UVA because we had a mutual friend who she was living with in first year dorms. Um, but I actually met Wright like my first week at UVA as well. <laughs> Uh, and we were both for making majors. So that was a really fun um, way that I think we connected early on. That's great. We're just a few days off Valentine's Day. So that's, <laughs> really, that's great to get that plug in. And I have to also say, you know, not realizing that you and Charlotte knew each other and had met. So that was that was very organic and wonderful as well. Um, so we'll move we'll move on to the other Mr. the other Harvey um, in in the conversation. And because right, you were studying, if I remember correctly, printmaking at UVA, but you're also doing finance or economics. 
Am I yeah, right? That's right. And, and yeah. first of all, Matthew, I just want to say thank you so much for organizing this. And I want to thank my esteemed co-panelists for having me on. Uh, Calvin and I were joking uh, before tonight. We're saying how quickly could we drive away the entire audience by just talking about our, how we met and how, uh, <laughs> how we got through this recent Valentine's Day. So we won't do that. Um, and it's also, Matthew, by the way, it's cruel to make me go right after Calvin. They're big shoes to fill, as always. Very uh, true. I've been, I've been on a panel before with Calvin myself, and I, I have experienced that. So. We, that. we will all try to shine like Calvin does on this panel. Um, so yeah, I also was not an art history major. I did, uh, I studied studio art and also spent a lot of time in the printmaking studio with uh, Calvin, Dean Das, and McKemi O'Hara. Um, I did take one art history class with Howard Singerman. He was at UVA before sure. uh, coming up here to run um, the Hunter uh, Studio Art or uh, Art History Department. And um, I ended up studying uh, studio art, focusing on printmaking, and then also double majoring in economics. And, you know, when, when you ask the question, how do we sort of get from there to today, um, you know, as, as one of the entrepreneurs on the panel, I have to sort of characterize myself by pulling out a Steve Jobs quote, when he says that it's, you can't really connect the dots going forward, but you can always connect them in hindsight. And I think majoring in economics and studio art was one of the major dots that got me from not just UVA, but growing up in Florida uh, to moving to New York and, and starting Sugarlift. Um, the other dot was actually, again, Calvin, you know, meeting Calvin at UVA, uh, you know, falling in love with a girl from New York and, you know, in the process, visiting New York with her when uh, Jean-Claude Christo Gates were in Central Park. Nice. And uh, we spent an afternoon at MoMA and, you know, I got to see some of the artists that I learned about in Howard Singerman's class. You know, the Robert Rauschenberg beds and Jasper Johns, Helen Frankenthaler, Jackson Pollock, getting to see all these things in person and realizing that New York was the place that I had to move to after school. And I'd say the, you know, the third important dot along the way uh, was just always wanting to pursue an entrepreneurial path. Uh, with my economics and, fin and, uh, and finance degree, I got a job at JP Morgan where I worked for about a decade out of school um, and you know, learned a lot about business and, and have brought a lot of that with me, but really spent all my extracurricular time with Calvin going to museums, traveling to go to museums and going to every restaurant in New York. Um, as many as as many as we could fit in, um, and I'd say that those were you know the three points that got uh, me to start Sugarlift. I know for those for everyone on online, um, Sugarlift doesn't quite have the same brand recognition that Sotheby's has. So if you're not familiar with us, we are a marketplace that makes it easy to collect art uh, directly from artist studios, and we do it in a way where we're trying to create more sustainable. Uh, careers for visual artists. Um, and, you know, I, when I was at JP Morgan, I realized that I wanted to pursue something entrepreneurial, something I was passionate about, but also something where I saw, you know, market opportunity. And I know we're going to talk a lot more about the art market, but I think there's an opportunity to influence how it develops over time, how we incorporate technology, and how we make it more sort of egalitarian for everyone involved. Absolutely, that's fantastic. And I have to say, right, I always, and you should just feel free to correct me, I always refer to Sugarlift as a gallery and you have a gallery space, you do exhibitions, but you just refer to it as a marketplace, I believe, connecting artists and collectors, which I, which does go, and we will get into certainly how Sugarlift is, has started out as a different model and how that's continuing. But I, I really, I, I think I need to update and I think it's important for us all to kind of update how we're talking around um, these historic and traditional um, spaces and ways of doing things that don't necessarily work in the same way or should work in the same way, really. And I think, you know, one of the main themes that's come out of all of these conversations that we've been having with our alumni in the arts 
is just how you know this last year in so many ways has been a reset and how now we're taking stock of that and moving forward. So I, I also love, you know, thank you for sharing. Um, you had this career in finance, but never left art behind, which is a, a, um, a story we hear with our students as well at UVA, even before they go out into, into the, the wider world. So many of our student docents, and we usually have around 60 to 70 student docents at any one time, most of them aren't art, art and art history majors or archeology span or anthropology. They're from disciplines across the university. And when I ask them why they're involved, why they're volunteering at the museum, they say it's the only way they can keep art as a part of their life because they're so busy in their majors. And so I love that you kind of continued that through after UVA, but now have found your way um, back, to, back to the mothership uh, of art. Um, so that's, that's fantastic. So Charlotte, I think um, of all of the panelists, you're the hero of the night because in the midst of a pandemic and everything in the last year, you've opened a gallery <laughs> recently, which I just think is, is spectacular on so many levels. Um, and we'll, we'll get into that more definitely too. But um, do I, did you study, did you study history or art history? I'm already forgetting. I, I just looked this up. So I studied art history at UVA say, right. and I graduated also in 2008, like Calvin. Um, I grew up, my parents are art collectors. My mom is a docent at the Asian Art Museum in San Francisco. We traveled all the time seeing great art. I just, I honestly, I don't think it was even an option for me not to be an art history major. I don't know what else I would have studied. Um, and at UVA, I, I think what was really important is I had some key internships. I interned at Les Yeux de Monde, which is a gallery that was on the downtown mall with Lynn Warren, who is also a UVA graduate. And uh, now she has that gallery at her house, somewhere on the outskirts of Charlottesville. Spectacular gallery, spectacular. And support, yeah. supports so many local as well as um, national artists and is a wonderful supporter of the of the Freyland. So thank you for the shout out to Lynn. Definitely. Yes. Um, yeah, it was a great internship and it really was the first time that I, you know, worked in the gallery and thought, you know, this is really what I want to do. Um, at UVA, I really fell in love with the storytelling aspect of art, listening to professors like Larry Getty talk about, um, you know, old master paintings or Dutch art of the golden age, you know, art that I, you know, stylistically maybe isn't my thing, but for some reason will always hold a soft spot in my heart, just hearing such passionate professors talk about art in such a way. I was like, I want to be that person that talks about art like that and shares, shares my love for something with someone else. Um, so yeah, so after I was an art history major at UVA, I am from San Francisco. I moved back to San Francisco, you know, applied for jobs at galleries and uh, it was 2008, nothing was happening. I <laughs> ended up, <laughs> I think I was a bit naive. I just figured I was like, I'm an art history major. I'm smart and motivated, it'll work out. But it was just such a funky time. Um, so what I did is I got an internship at Christie's which is another auction house like Sotheby's in the regional office in San Francisco. And I did that internship for about a year, which was interesting, um, but really made me further solidify that I wanted to be more in the contemporary art gallery scene. So I went back to graduate school at San Francisco Art Institute, which is a historic institution there and got my master's in exhibition and museum studies. And during graduate school, I had the opportunity to spend a summer curating a printmaking show in China with a, with a fellow uh, student at SFEI, which was really interesting to me. And um, yeah, so after SFAI, I worked at a number of different contemporary art galleries in San Francisco, um, love them, but I felt like I was sort of missing out on the connection of being with the artist and more the art making process. I felt like my roles had been pretty administrative. And so I left the gallery world to work at an arts nonprofit um, called Creativity Explored, which was, we had two galleries actually, and um, studio space for 135 artists with developmental disabilities. And my role was telling these artists stories. And it was a really pivotal change for me in the way that I viewed 
art and the art market and the range of, you know, where you can source artwork from. So I did that job until I, uh, I think my daughter was a year and I just had a really brutal commute. So it was a logistical switch. Um, sometimes job changes just are logistical. So I um, started doing a number of different things. I started a wooden greeting card company with a friend, which sort of dipped my toe into the entrepreneurial world. I did flower arranging classes, um, all while staying home, you know, pretty much full time um, with my, at that time I had just had one child. Fast forward to where I am now. I, uh, my husband got a new job in Raleigh, North Carolina. And so we had two weeks notice of our move and here we are. So um, yeah, I uh, opened Charlotte Russell Contemporary. It's a gallery in Raleigh about a month ago. I have been planning it since I moved, but just didn't find the right space quite yet and needed a little bit put a little bit of a push. And um, apparently the pandemic is the push that I needed. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, the push that a lot of us have needed. Um, and it's so great, you know, right. I didn't know that Steve Jobs quote um, about connecting the dots. And I'm going to, that's, I, it's one of the best quotes I've heard in a long time. And I think Charlotte just, you know, brilliantly demonstrated that. Um, and that it's oftentimes, and I talk with students a lot about this, and I'm sure you do when you have um, young people and in, coming into the field, um, it's frequently a meandering path. Um, and you just have to, you know, where you can embrace that, and you and you don't know where the next, the next dot is going to lead. But um, if you if you kind of are true to yourself and true to your purpose, and I think each of you have spoken really beautifully about understanding, you know, eventually where you wanted to to go more or less and end up that 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 comes about. Charlotte, you've done quite a bit of art writing though as well. Um, yes, so I um, I love to write. As I said, I love the storytelling aspect of art. And so throughout graduate school, maybe even prior, um, I think pretty much since I moved back to San Francisco, I wrote for um, different freelance art publications, little articles, sometimes paid, sometimes not at the beginning. Um, and I, I still continue to do arts writing now. So I write for um, a few local publications. And sometimes it's from the perspective of a I guess now a gallery owner, um, but usually it's sort of more like collector features or artist features or artful interiors and that kind of thing. So yeah, I think I'll always do the art writing. It's just fun. It's great. Well, and it's also so necessary for anyone on the call that really is a part of the art world or follows the art world. We all know how quickly art writing of all type is disappearing. It's always the first thing to get cut. Um, so thank you, particularly for being regional in your art writing, um, because that that is disappearing, I think, fastest of all. So thank you. Um, you know, we've we've touched on already um, in this conversation. Certainly, the other conversations we've had with alumni have really um, focused on the extraordinary circumstances in the last year of the global pandemic coupled with the long overdue insistence on social justice and equity in all walks of life, including the arts. Um, and we're gonna, we're gonna get to both, um, both of those kind of strands of conversation. Um, first, you know, right now, because we're in a, a digital a program right now, like um, all museums, galleries, and auction houses had to make hard pivots um, overnight really to virtual programming. And this has been a seismic shift, one of the major seismic shifts, uh, certainly in museums that will endure post pandemic. I think the commercial world was a little bit ahead of certainly the museum world and in, in, um, really understanding digital platforms and how they could um, increase uh, a number of things, including accessibility. So I, I'm interested to hear from each of you um, you know, how the last year has changed your own relationship and your business's relationship to technology. And right, I think we can we can start with you, right? Um, you know, Sugarlift, as as we kind of alluded to already, already started out as a non-traditional platform or gallery space, um, really uh, privileging connecting artists and collectors to, I think you, I think your words were create sustainable practices or something along those lines, which is really critical. 
um, and has been a critical part of the debate within the gallery world, certainly in the last decade. So you already had quite a strong digital presence, or at least as long as I've known you um, and known Sugarlift you have. So, you know, walk us through this last year and what's changed for you um, in the virtual world. How is it, how has it made your model, has it made your model any different? Um, and, and what you see moving forward. Yeah, definitely. Part of our, you know, Coca-Cola secret recipe has always been to embrace technology. And, you know, I was looking at, I was laughing with some of my um, partners at Sugarlift. We were looking at the 2020 plan that we put together, you know, December 2019 or January 2020, um, and just realizing how, uh, you know, in a different place we ended up at the end of last year than we had anticipated. And, you know, to follow on to your Steve Jobs quote uh, about connecting the dots, yeah, another one that I love is Lewis Carroll, which is, um, if you don't know where you're going, any path will take you there. So we always, you know, we'd like to write down the goals for the year and try to stick to them as close as possible. Obviously that was, that was impossible in a year like last year. Um, you know, I think uh, I've heard a lot of people talk about the effects of COVID as, you know, what was disrupted, this and that. And I think that the, the wisest people I listen to talk about COVID being more of an accelerator than anything else. It sort of picked up on trends that we we're already seeing, you know, not just in the art market, but across the economy and really just, you know, put rocket fuel on them. Uh, you know, so a couple examples we're just seeing you know, a decrease in in-person retail sales and sales moving online. Uh, in the gallery space, you know, galleries were already hurting and you're seeing sales decline pre-COVID. Some of that was going to, you know, sales at art fairs, but some of that was also going online. Um, and I, I was looking at some research and saw that, you know, on average gallery sales were down about 40% last year as a result of COVID, which is, I mean, that's just, that's an unbelievable, you know, downturn in one year. Um, part of the silver lining is that a lot of those sales moved online. So pre-COVID, the art market was doing about 10% of its sales online. Last year, that jumped up, you know, 4X to about 40% of gallery sales were done online. I mean, that's an unheard of inflection point um, and obviously a result of what we went through. Um, so what did we do at Sugarlift? As we are saying, we've always embraced innovation, embraced technology as a way of creating more efficient connections. So we've always had a foot on technology online and, and another foot in the real world. Um, in March and April, uh, you know, this is another story that Calvin and I could tell. March 13th, we packed up our bags and moved out to her, her parents' house in the suburbs. For, you know, we packed, we packed for five days, worst case scenario, one week, and we, we moved back in the city seven months later. Right. So in, uh, in March and April, we had to move to, you know, an all online sales format. And because we had always sort of invested in uh, people experiencing art online, collecting art online, we were very prepared to do that. Um, I guess more prepared than many in the art space. Um, I'd like to say that I can see around corners, but I, I prefer the quote. I don't know who I can attribute it to, but it's better to be lucky than good. <laughs> and we're certainly lucky in that case. Um, you know, one of the things that we did in addition to that was uh, online engagement. So, um, you know, I probably watch way too much uh, Cuomo on his, his daily briefings, but one of the things, one of his... Uh, pillars was that let's think of how we can build back better or, or use COVID as a way to do things better than we did before. So we thought, well, if we're doing online events, how can we do things that are cooler than we could do in person? So we did things like a, our first event was a show called Biophilia, which is Latin, I think, for uh, the love of nature. We launched that in May and created a 3D space that we could walk through where the artist's heads would pop up and they'd talk about their art. We had about 250 people come to the opening, uh, miraculously stay the whole time. And it was something that we would have never done otherwise. Um, and I think another way of engaging with people that might stick uh, post COVID. Absolutely. Um, 
so talk to me a little because that is that's very different i was i'm going to jump ahead on my notes and hopefully that's not going to throw me off what you're doing with that um three-dimensional space is very very different than what the larger galleries have done with their viewing rooms and which were just largely pdfs <laughs> um that you had early access to for the fair so for everyone you know obviously the 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 art the global art fairs that have become such an important part of the entire art contemporary and well the entire art e ecosystem all had to be canceled in the last year and went online and one of the things that um i was really interested as someone who goes to the fairs of what these the, everyone announced that there would be these um online private viewing rooms and you would get your access very much like you get your vip access in real life and who's first into the and i was expecting what you talked about right <laughs> that there would be some kind of you know um three-dimensional embodied experience but they were really just pdfs <laughs> for the most part <laughs> online that you scrolled through and it was really disheartening so talk to me a little bit about that decision to really push forward and and do you see that continuing absolutely I, you know going back to you know right before starting sugarlift i looked at the art infrastructure the art markets um, unwillingness to embrace technology in general uh, it's one of the last markets that's been forced to figure out how technology is going to disrupt just the relationship between artists and galleries and museums and buyers. And, uh, you know, that reticence has, has led to things, irrational things like, like viewing rooms. Right. And I had the same experience as you when I, I learned about the David's Warner viewing room and I went to the website and I didn't know what was going to happen when I clicked the button. Was I going to be transported into this virtual world where I'm right. surrounded by amazing art? And I clicked the button and it turned out that a viewing room is a website. Right. And uh, yes. I was very yes. underwhelmed. And it's, you know, it's, it's embarrassing when you can't admit the obvious things right in front of your own eyes. Um, I'm, not, I'm not turning this into a political conversation at all, but um, I know when you sent the, uh, the list of topics we're gonna talk about and you said, what should we uh, leave behind post pandemic? And my answer, was definitely going to be viewing rooms. Right. <laughs> Excellent. I'm glad that we were, and I, I was not going to use any names. I was trying to be very, very, um, uh, you, know, um, you know, classy in my, <laughs> in my <laughs> criticism, but I had the exact same different gallery. I will say it was a different gallery, but my first viewing room, <laughs> it had been, I had received so many emails about it. And I thought, this is going to be the future. This is going to be, you know, do I need some kind of VR headset? Am I ready for this? And then it was, it was like a, I thought the same a, thing. a website that you clicked on a link and the usual PDF. <laughs> and I was just, I was really, just, I was really sad actually. <laughs> not only could I not go to the fair, I, I couldn't even like have a new experience. So thank you, thank you for, I'm so glad that you have confirmed yeah, um, everything I think about. On that, I, there are better ways and more, um, you know, innovative ways to view art online than a PDF, but you know, I think all of us are on this call because we've had that experience of standing in front of a painting at the Met, at the Fralin, um, and, and that experience, I don't think we can recreate yet. Absolutely. So I think, I we, think uh, nor will we, I have to say, I'm going to, we will never recreate that. And we shouldn't, I don't think we should try to recreate that really, because that is, that will ultimately be the strength of the object. We can create something I think adjacent, and I think that's what that's what you are doing with Sugarlift. Yeah. I'm really interested in that. Absolutely, I, I think we need to think about it as there. You know, there are pros and cons of both. You know, technology and in person, and how can we embrace the best of both? We could. I. I again, I'm so bad about rabbit holes. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna move over um, to Charlotte and talk about you know opening a opening a gallery in the midst of a pandemic when certainly, you know, things can be more open now than they were, but it's really hard um, to make those initial connections. So I'm wondering how you're having to, 
how you're doing that and if you're leaning on technology in ways that you wouldn't have if you had opened the gallery a year, you know, a year and a half ago. I see, I feel like I have a unique situation where I opened January 8th. I signed the lease on this space December 1st. I had no time to, to really second guess it and I just went for it. Um, so to build a program and build a business where you know rally is open people are able to come into my gallery there's capacity limits but um you know i haven't it hasn't i haven't had to rush anyone out um so far so it's funny because i i sort of can operate like a traditional gallery where people are able to come in i'm open for regular hours um but alongside that you know building a business from the beginning that yeah, you know, like the technology is important. Um, so definitely doing more recorded artist talks and focusing on sort of stories that I can tell about the art by posting them on Instagram, you know, things that I'm, I'm not that comfortable like hearing or seeing myself talk, but having to do that because that's, if people can't come in or, or they, um, you know, aren't in Raleigh being able to, to really hear the story behind it without having that in-person experience. So yeah, I mean, it's the way the, uh, you know, building it online, I don't have the technology that sounds like Wright has with that, with that um, 3D artist popping out. That sounds super cool. Um, so I think my, my website is a little bit more traditional, but yeah, just engaging more with my social channel, me personally, than I would normally do. I'll also give your Instagram a plug. Um, as I was doing my research for tonight, I you, you know I see posts that I'm scrolling through, but I like went to your Instagram page. It is so spectacularly beautiful. <laughs> and now I feel I feel like that could be a you know not that you need a side hustle on top of opening uh, a um, new gallery, but uh, you are definitely producing one of the most aesthetically pleasing um, Instagram. Uh, pages that I've come across and I look at a lot. So I'm, I'm taking notes, I have to say. Oh, thank you. So my goal on Instagram is to showcase the artwork and tell the story behind it. So I try to be stu super strategic about it. That said, when I worked at Creativity Explored, my job was social media. So I do have some experience in working in it, but it's social media is sort of a necessary evil. I mean, you can't ignore it. You need to use it. And Honestly, most of my sales have happened through Instagram. Um, I FaceTime collectors, that's how sales happen. It's all through technology. Although my doors are open, um, the amount of people that come in and purchase something is not, that has not happened yet. It's all been um, connections via technology. So I think to Wright's point earlier, the pandemic has accelerated trends because certainly, I mean, Calvin and I were on a panel for the New York club. Gosh, I had just come to the Freyland. So it's I think you had just started, yeah. It's been four years and it was the two of us and Nick Aquavella, also a, one of our wonderful uh, alums who will, will rope into one of these in the future. Um, and we were talking that night largely about um, art fairs and how they had revolutionized um, what we were doing. Uh, but we got into, you know, Nick was saying and Calvin, you were saying that um, so much of it is done on the iPhone now and that initial contact is on the iPhone and fast forward four years in a pandemic and it's just spectacular the amount of uh, connection and sales um, that are happening in that way. I have a quick question before we move on to Calvin. I'm, I'm, I am looking at the Q and A's and we are getting, we will be getting to them, I promise. Um, Robin asks, could Charlotte tell us briefly about the piece hanging behind her? Ooh, I'd love to. So I am currently sitting in front of a work called Where Trouble Melts Like Lemon Drops. It is a nice. hundred of what the artist calls curiosities. They are found aluminum with a caustic. Oh, wow. Over. And so each one of these has like a little inventory number. I don't know if you can see it. Yeah, absolutely. My awkward absolutely. computer skills here. No, you're doing, um, you're doing great. Far better than I could. Yeah, so they each have a little inventory number. And the artist used to work at a natural science museum doing exhibition 
installations. So she was really interested in this, co this concept of placing them as if they're scientific specimens on the wall. Nice. She, um, she draws uh, inspiration for the forms from things like fungus and lichen and different natural forms. So yeah, that's where trouble melts like lemon drops. It's a Raleigh artist, Kelly, Kelly Shepard Murray. And um, yeah, she has these curiosities on view. Very nice, cool. Yeah. Um, thank you, Robin, for such a great question. Um, I do wanna, I, before we get off and really start talking about um, social justice and diversity in the, in the field, um, I, I wanna keep a little bit more on technology because I do feel that of all of us, the auction houses were ahead of the game in this in a lot of ways because in the last few years, there just seemed to be more and more online sales. Sotheby's in particular was diversifying its type of sale that was going online, the types of collections that were going online. And I was um, owning, up, I'm owning up to my own stereotyping that it seems like that might be more organic for the modern and contemporary crowd and maybe less so for the old master crowd, but I am fully fully owning my stereotype. <laughs> okay, it's okay, you can own it. <laughs> we'll, we'll admit it in our department right. as well. So maybe Before. you can talk more broadly about the auction house and, and yeah. auction houses in general, Calvin, and then a little bit about the old master field in particular. <laughs> Absolutely. I think, um, I, I mean, Sotheby's has completely transformed over the past year and and it's definitely not you turning when this goes back. Um, it has been unbelievable to watch. I mean, we started these online sales a few years ago, as you alluded to, and you know, it's always sort of lower level property trying to see, and you know, we always had the online bidding. And I remember maybe this was five or six years ago, standing in a London sales room in an evening sale, which is like tradition. I mean, old masters London evening sale, like so traditional, right? Um, <laughs> mostly white hair in the room. And on the phone, and suddenly an online bid comes in for this piece at like a million dollars. You know, everyone's going, what? You know, it was like, you know, and it was sort of mind blowing at the time. And now, like, that's so normal. Um, people have started doing that, and our sales are now held entirely online. I mean, we had a sale two weeks ago where the auctioneer is in London. We are on the phone with our clients being filmed in New York. Our colleagues in London are in a separate studio from the auctioneer being filmed as well. It's all sort of multi-camera being live streamed to audiences watching from YouTube. Um, it is a totally different experience. I don't even think I realized because I watched some of that. I didn't realize that the auctioneer was in a different room than the people on the, I, I don't think that that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, was, he's in like a, a studio yeah, just looking yeah. at screens from, you know, London, New York, Hong oh, Kong, oh, Paris sometimes. It's, um, it's, I mean, it's, it's incredible the technology. And I think we're all really grateful that the technology is there to help us be able to do this. Cause even just a few years ago, um, I think it would have been difficult, but, <clears throat> um, but it's amazing to see I have to say, going back to March and April, I mean, we held a few online sales right away. You know, Sotheby said, you know, we can't stop. We have all these sales lined up. Let's shift them into the online sale format. We can do it. We have the infrastructure. Um, and so we did it and they did spectacularly. You right. know, everyone was sitting at home bidding. And so we saw not only, you know, it was something like 35, 40% brand new worldwide clients coming into these like, little old master sales being held online, but also our top, top tier clients just sitting there like casually bidding away, buying things. And um, it, it was amazing. Um, so I think it's, it's been an exciting way to reach new audiences. Our marketing department has really gone wild. I think the opportunity is similar to what Charlotte and Wright have been talking about with the ability to like hear directly from artists in a format like this. I mean, our, our virtual events, we were having one the other week and it was like, oh, great. Of course we could call this great scholar in London and see if he'll be on because it's a virtual event. You know, everything, things like that um, in terms of going back to educating people and storytelling um, have really exploded in new and different ways. And no one's going out to parties. So they're, they're sitting at home and engaged and Absolutely. excited. <laughs> and Matthew, I just want to add one thing to that because, you know, not only is, is Calvin's team at Sotheby's you know, it's almost surprising that they're embracing technology, being all masters. You sort of picture this like 
you know, old dusty library by candlelight with every, you know, a lot of tweed going on. And when you, you look at what they're doing, it's extremely innovative, but also the team running it. You know, Calvin is, and her colleague, David Pollock are two young, just like rising stars at Sotheby's who are the future of the old master's department. She's got a lot of other young colleagues who are full of energy and realize how exciting something like old masters can be. I mean, for all of us who've gotten bitten by the bug, like that's where the good stuff is. And she has, you know, influencers like Victoria Beckham who are collecting old masters. There are, you know, sh chic Upper East Side mamas who are buying important old masters pieces um, and realizing not just what a great value it is relative to con contemporary, but just how cool it is on an absolute basis. Anyway, just wanted to throw that plug in. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, I think go ahead. I was going to say the, the other biggest technology change, I think, for the old master's department is um, the writing our, our old catalogs. That's been our, our biggest thing that's sort of shifting away into right. these online things and that we are um, probably dragging our heels on the most of any other department in the company as they try to be more green, not be printing all these catalogs all the time and lean into the um, online catalogs. Um, but ultimately we've realized that like the online catalogs are so much better. We're doing these videos, we can link to different websites, we can recreate rooms where things hung. It's, um, you know, going back to that storytelling and bringing things out of the old dusty libraries. It's been really fun. Yeah, there's been a real leap forward in those online catalogs because it used to be a very, where you were trying to replicate the, the, the hard copy catalog and it just didn't work and the technology was always a pain and you'd skip forward three pages and you only want to go one page and all, <laughs> of, all of that. But I have seen, you're absolutely right. They're becoming such a rich experience with all of the embedded material and the recreations. Um, I, I am I am slowly, but I think firmly being won over by the online catalog. I'll also say the number of conversations that I've had with my colleagues in the museum world of how excited we all are that the auctions are now online and on YouTube, even if we're not um, bidding on anything, if we're just watching and we can now watch in our pajamas with wine, like <laughs> with every with everything. And that, that has been a, a real welcome um, as well. And you kind of right really went into a question, I'll just ask you a little bit more specifically that we had um, about the old master uh, collector. Are younger people, are you bringing up a new um, kind of cohort of younger old master collectors. And it sounds like that's happening um, and really exciting. So maybe a, a little bit about that before we, we move on. Yeah, I mean, you know, we're definitely trying. That's, that's the goal. And that's something that I'm very passionate about and obviously need for my career to go forward over the next however many decades. <laughs> um, but, you know, it's, I think it's, um, we're seeing more and more collectors that aren't sort of ticking boxes in their collections. And I think Charlotte and Wright will probably say the same thing. You know, when I first started, or especially 10 or 15 years ago before that, collectors sort of came in. I collect Dutch old masters. Here are the 12 artists that I want to collect. Now we're seeing people mixing things. You know, I want to hang my tough contemporary art next to this like super funky Renaissance uh, gold ground painting, you know? Or I want to take my de Kooning sculpture and put it next to a John Bologna bronze, right? And you start to see these people, these collectors really want to have conversations between their art, bring in different eras, bring in different things, and sort of showcase their own vision and eye. And, you know, I think that's exciting. I think it's really fun. It's much more fun to walk into a collection that is varied um, and that, that shows someone's excited about learning different things. Um, so it's definitely, it's definitely growing and it's, um, I'm excited about it. That's great. That's good to hear. Um, you know, as a solid modern and contemporary person myself, I do love the old masters equally. So I, I want that to continue as well. And much like you have to bring up a new and younger audience, it's the, it's the exact same for museums. We have to, we have to bring up our, our new audiences as well. So that's, that's fantastic. Um, you know, just sorry, just to jump in one more time, we, uh, Calvin and I, I think it was right before COVID hit, we went to see the new 
uh, director of the Metropolitan Museum Speak, uh, Max Colin. And, uh, and he was talking about how to shake things up a little bit too. He wanted to, you know, recurate some of the galleries where you brought in art being created at the same time in different geographies yeah. or art from different cultures sort of addressing the same theme and looking at art as these different expressions or different kind of language, a way to see across styles and, and, and see the, you know, just the merits of what, the dialogue between the two. And I think that's a really interesting thing you know, as yeah. a museum expert, I'm, I'm from the outside looking in. Yeah, no, I think that's critical. Um, and I'm glad that Matt is starting to think in those ways. It's also a part of the larger practice of decolonization and the conversations around that that are going in, on in museums. You know, the Met for the first time is including work by Native American artists in the American galleries, um, which shows just that in that one instance, how, uh, narrow-minded and colonialist our practices have been um, for so long. And that's a, gr a great sub, sub segue, excuse me, into uh, you know, the next part of we've had the pandemic, but we've also had um, the mass awakening to the long talked about, but you know, woefully little acted upon need for greater diversity, inclusion, and equity in the art world. Um, and this is certainly playing out every day in museums um, through its, as we reckon uh, with our past and continued support of exclusionary, exclusionary and frankly racist practices um, that have gone on in museums for too long. Uh, but it's certainly playing out in the commercial world as well, uh, um, particularly over the last year. Uh, as we put these, as I'm putting these panels together, um, they have tended like tonight to be very white um, that you know, should come as no surprise given UVA's history, um, but also the history of how and why people have been able to choose careers in the art world and the privilege that has been associated um, with that for so long. So I, I'm gonna go to you, um, Wright and Charlotte first in the, in the kind of gallery world. Um, both of you are clearly and vocally thinking about diversity. Um, in your artist rosters and how you are elevating um, voices um, within within your programs. Um, and Charlotte, you specifically talk in your in your kind of mission statement about underrepresented artists um, and prioritizing them in your gallery. I'm wondering how you're approaching that. I want to know how you're both approaching that and thinking about it. You know, I imagine it's it's a different thought process and process for you, Charlotte, as a regional gallery in Raleigh than it is for you right in Brooklyn. So Charlotte, why don't, if you wanna talk about that since you've mm -hmm. just opened your gallery and how and you're in the process of forming your roster. Sure, so um, it's actually been my concept for the gallery since working at Creativity Explored to create a platform for showcasing artists from all different backgrounds. Um, while I love creativity explored in organizations that do champion artists with developmental disabilities, I wanted to create a space that wasn't solely dedicated to one population of person. I think it's problematic to further pigeonhole a group of people into like, this is a show by artists with disabilities. I think that, I, that it's important to create a space where artists from all different walks of life are in conversation with each other in the same exhibition. So it was my concept prior to the last year. So um, it's you know fortunate that I already was thinking of that in terms of what I wanted to do in a space. So how I do that is I, um, I you know, curate shows that are inclusive of artists with different backgrounds. So it's really a, a dialogue between the artworks and obviously artists' stories always come in to the works that they make. Um, but it's sort of, I you know think of a concept or I think of, of some tie between the works and it includes artists that you know have an intellectual or developmental disability or do not. And I primarily, I think I only have one male artist on my roster and he has, he's an artist with autism. So um, the rest are female. And yeah, so it's just, you know, I'm, I'm at a good stage where I'm onboarding artists at this moment. So I can, I can think about the artists that I wanna showcase in terms of creating a more inclusive approachable space. And that also goes to, you know, I always found 
all situations in the art world really intimidating, um, you know, from art fairs to all of that. And even when you are working in the arts, it just seems really unattainable and unapproachable. So um, in terms of the collectors and people that I'm bringing in, it's also, I wanna make that experience more inclusive as well. So one way I'm doing that is doing um, price transparency. So my prices for everything are listed. They should be on every social post about the artwork and then all on the website and everywhere um, just to make it people not feel like I can't come into this space I that's above my means or whatever. All the work on view I have is, is I would say, on the more affordable range. Um, so. so, yeah, I mean, I'm just in an advantage where I'm starting fresh now and I can think about how I want to envision a space to be the best. That's great. I think, you know, one of the things as I was looking at your roster, I noticed that you had... Um, someone with autism on, on the autism spectrum and talked about that and, and talked about that experience. Um, and so neurodiversity is something that often gets lost in the larger diversity conversations. And it's certainly something that we're thinking widely about in the museum field. So I was really thrilled to have you on tonight to highlight that because of the work that you've done. Um, but also, you know, you're, you're um, thinking about this as, you know, inclusion, including, but not separating through that inclusion. Mm -hmm. So not doing the show of just um, neurodiverse artists, but having them in with artists who are not neurodiverse. You know, I, th I think that's, that's really um, absolutely the kind of conversations and thinking that we're having in the museum world as well. And I think that's, that's exciting. Right. What about, what about you and Sugarlift? How, how is this last year and the and the critical demands for social justice changed what you're doing in the gallery or, your, or what you're going to do in the gallery. Yeah, it's, it's a really important topic and it's something that we could, we could have a marathon panel and talk yeah. for days about the complexity of this issue. It's something uh, that I, I think about a lot. And one of the ways that I think about it, which I think is a little bit different than most is, is sort of the, like, the why, like, why have diversity in museums, in galleries, in the art market in general. And I feel like it's often talked about as something that's like an obligation. It's like, oh, well, the art market's super white. Look at all these stats. And therefore you need to make it more diverse. You need to have more uh, you know, BIPOC artists. And I, I look at it quite differently. I, I think that you know, there, there's a lot of uh, research. There are a lot of stories that not just in the art market, but in any field, especially when it comes to creative fields, usually when they're more diverse, they end up being a lot better. Yeah. So to draw some easy corollaries, you know, I'm a, I'm a food person and, um, you know, I like to go to as many uh, restaurants as I can with Calvin and now with the kids, obviously, I'm, that's, that's the thing I'm looking forward to the most post-COVID. And you know, just it's one of the reasons why I love being here in New York. You know, within a mile radius, I can go to South India, I can go to uh, West Africa, I can go to Korea, and just the diversity of cultures. Of, if you consider food a creative field, which I do, like all those having all those things accessible to me makes my life that much better. When you think about music. You know, it'd be great to listen to Elvis and the Beatles, they're amazing, and I can always listen to classic rock, but when you throw Kanye in the mix, you know, in the full spectrum in between, there's just more better diversity of music to listen to. And I think when it comes to the art market, when more perspectives and more backgrounds are heard, then we just have more new, you know, better art to look at. Right. And as it relates to what we do at Sugarlift, we, we currently work with about uh, 250 artists today. 60% um, of the artists that uh, sell on, are on through Sugarlift are female artists and about 15% uh, are, are BIPOC artists. Um, it's something where, you know, we consider ourselves, it's sort of, you know, morally obligated to raise this bar as leaders in the space. We don't know what the, what the end goal is, but we, can, we know that we can do better. Um, 
This is not a virtual background. I'm actually sitting in the gallery. We have a show up of two female artists, uh, Lydia Baker and Angela Graham. It's amazing. Uh, we're doing a show this May called Skin, which is gonna focus on the niche uh, character of, of skin being the main feature of a painting, um, both the diversity of the subject and the diversity of the artists and seeing where that, where that takes us. Um, but obviously I, I think that the art market, you know, I was looking, I was doing some research and I saw that Artsy said the top of the top 10 artists who experienced the most increase in demand last year, uh, the top seven were all black artists. So I think that that's a result of an increased demand from buyers, increased demand from institutions. Those are all good things and moving in the right direction, but clearly we have a long ways to go. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, to your point, when there are more voices, when there are more perspectives, when there are more lived experiences, we are all lifted up. And for too long, for all of the economic and social and, and colonial, post-colonial racist reasons, um, so many have been, you know, kept out of these conversations. So it's, it's really encouraging to hear from the field that there is real commitment to, and a commitment to learning and understanding because it's a process and it's, it's, you know, there's still, as you said, a long, a long way um, to go. We are, this has been such a fantastic conversation. We're already running over. So I'm gonna try and not run it over too long, um, but I do wanna ask Calvin because we hear a lot about the museum and the gallery world and our efforts to, you know, work on what we call DEAI, diversity, equity, accessibility, and inclusion, we don't necessarily hear as much about what's happening um, within the auction houses. So, um, you know, certainly talking a little bit about bringing in a younger audience, particularly for the old masters, but are you, how are you, are you diversifying that audience? Are you seeing that audience diversify? How is Sotheby's or just the, or auction houses in general, your colleagues thinking about these, thinking about these issues? You know, I, I work in a field that is by definition, as in old masters, by definition, our artists, like 97% are white men. Um, and, you know, and I, I, I think Sotheby's in general as a whole is obviously looking to diversify. I would love to diversify our audience more for sure in Old Masters. But I also think that, and this goes back to our storytelling, you know, we need to look at how we're telling these stories, how we're cataloging our artwork, what we're talking about, you know, who, who were these people and are there some difficult things that we need to, to say about them? And I know um, the Met just reopened their, um, Old master galleries, and they really um, spent a lot of time rewriting all of their labels, you know? So the paintings haven't changed, but the way in which you see them are, they're gonna point out that that wonderful Philippe de Champagne portrait that, you know, I've looked at for years and have always known, I didn't realize that he was holding, you know, a deed to um, opening up a uh, new slave uh, trade in America, you know, and open, widening our lens uh, our lenses to that has been really interesting. Um, personally, on a smaller level, um, I have really been trying to raise awareness about female master artists. Um, it's, you know, it's a small part of our market, but it's something that I can feel passionate about and excited about in trying to tell their stories and get more people involved. Um, one of the great things is that we're seeing sort of this great growing enthusiasm coming out of the scholarly committee, you know, um, community. Finally, there are exhibitions devoted to these women coming out of the museums who want to collect them now. Um, and then coming out of private collectors who also want to diversify their collections. So I think it's, um, you know, for us, I, you know, I wish I could have a more diverse array of artists that I knew and worked with, but, um, but that's something that I'm working on in the old master field. Absolutely, and I think you make a great point. It's the it takes the entire ecosystem of the arts to to enact these changes, these systemic changes that mm -hmm. we all see, and that, and that's absolutely right. I just want to remind we're going to wrap it up soon. If you, there are some questions in the Q and A, um, if you have any more questions, get those in now. I'm going to say there's a great question um, from Hans on deaccessioning. 
uh, deaccessioning, which is the process of a museum divesting itself of parts of its permanent collection. That is a, its own conversation topic. <laughs> I will tell you that today there was a very good panel discussion that was um, covered live by some, some of the standouts in the Twitter sphere um, of the art world. Uh, on from the Southeast Museums Conference, SEMC, which is one of our regional professional organizations. It will be up on SEMC's uh, YouTube page within a few days. It's one of the best uh, discussions of directors and previous museum directors on deaccessioning. I will say Hans, part of his question is, um, if museums are moving toward deaccessioning because there has been a relaxing of some of our ethical guidelines or standards by our, our one of our lead organizations. Again, it's its own night, so I can't, I'm not going to go down that rabbit hole. Um, but would you expect to see um, a number of these deaccessions de uh, coming through the auction house, or would you see them in private sales? And I would say that um, best practices of deaccessioning is in the light. And so best practices of deaccessioning are working with um, our, our partners in the in the auction houses so that those are sold um, sold publicly and and transparently and I, I think it's really um, important to know that Sotheby's and Christie's and the other large auction houses all have units that are devoted to working with museums on these very important um, issues another great alum who could not join us but she's here in spirit uh, Christy Coombs uh, is one of the heads of that for Sotheby's and does a lot of work to support the Fralin. Um, hi, Christy, if you're watching. <laughs> um, so that's a great question. Uh, very quickly, um, can you discuss how you go about finding diverse artists? So Wright and Charlotte, um, what are some of the channels you use as you're looking for artists to bring in uh, to, the, to your rosters? I can go. Um, for me, it, um, you know, I worked with 105 artists with developmental disabilities in San Francisco. So pulling from artists that I love and have worked with before is, is, was easy. In, um, and then in terms of finding new artists, honestly, I found a lot of artists through Instagram, just going on and seeing um, people posting, looking at um, sometimes especially this spring, a lot of my um, artist friends from graduate school would post about their artist friends that were having some sort of sale or some sort of talk or some sort of something. So um, really just going, going through and finding artists that I like and seeing who they're talking about it or, you know, galleries that I like and see who they're talking about. One of the great things right now is that all these top galleries are doing so many virtual events, um, doing Instagram stories or IGTV, and so you can see so many great artwork virtually that you wouldn't normally get a chance to do. So, yeah. I resisted for a long time, but Instagram is a game changer. It's where every, every curator I know is just living on Instagram. And I rely on our brilliant curators at the Freyland since I'm not so heavily involved um, as I once was when I was a curator. They, they're they constantly telling me artists to look at on Instagram and it's, it's, it's incredible, really incredible. And I guess the new social platform that a lot of the art world is using is called Clubhouse. And so I just joined Clubhouse and I listened to this like three hour talk of about um, including black collectors and black artists in the gallery setting. It's just, so interesting. So that's another platform that you can use. Um, yeah, right I now. just Clubhouse. learned about Clubhouse. Mm -hmm. that's, I feel like I'm now that I'm a director, I'm a little out of it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like worried about, you know, the roof and things like that. <laughs> so but yes, I will be checking out Clubhouse definitely. Right? What about what about you? I got left behind in Snapchat. So there's right. one. <laughs> yeah, I, that's kind of I, I never did Snapchat. I feel the same way. Thank you for thank you for affirming that. I, I just say I, I couldn't have answered it any better than Charlotte. So I'll leave it at that. Perfect. Um, I think I don't see any more questions. We've gone a little over but this I mean, this could go all night. Absolutely. I want to thank um, Charlotte and Wright and Calvin for being so generous with your time and thoughts this evening. I have, I have learned so much. I have a lot that I'm taking away from tonight. Thank you. If, 
and particularly um, that Steve Jobs quote. That's that's really <laughs> so. Um, I'm sure our audience feels the same way. I'm already seeing some people in the Q and A saying ter terrific program. Thank you. Uh, we have so much programming coming up from the Freyland that is free and accessible to all online. So please make sure to check check out our social media, our Facebook and Instagram frequently for updates. Head over to our website as well and sign up for our emails if you're not on our list. Check out the Freylin from Home page when you're on um, our website for programs that are suited for every age. These alumni programs are proving so popular and we are pulling from our established list of alumni, um, but those are definitely incomplete. So if you're out there and you're an alum working in the arts, or if you know someone who fits that profile, please reach out and let us know. We're planning to continue these. I've already got two in the works um, for the coming months, and I think that these are going to continue even when we're able to be um, embodied again because of all the reasons of accessibility and we can never pull all three of you together as easily as we did tonight. Um, so it's it's really fantastic. As <laughs> always, everyone out there, thank you for supporting the Freylin. If you aren't already a member, please consider becoming a member. Your membership supports our mission and programming like this and is so important to continuing the work for the communities we serve. Right, did you have something? Yes. Yeah, so last last things one, from our panelists, I, I should say as well. Ahead. There's no better network than the UVA network. And I think I can speak for Charlotte and Calvin in saying that that network has been essential in building our careers. All three of us are you know, ready to take your emails and calls and spend some time to give you our two cents. So please feel free to reach out. Thank you, absolutely. That's been, you know, I did, I made the poor choice of not going to UVA, um, but I'm so happy to be a, a, a member of the family now. And that was one of the, astonishing things to me when I first arrived at UVA is the incredible alumni network and how open and and helpful you all are to one another. If you've never met before, you can just say, um, I, I went to UVA and it immediately starts a conversation. I've even been in restaurants in New York where I have been having a conversation at my table and someone three tables over has heard UVA and come up to me in the middle of a conversation and said, did you go to UVA? And then I have to say, no, unfortunately I just work there. I didn't go there. I'm not a fool who, um, but it has, I've had that happen multiple times now around the country. It's, it's really spectacular. So if you're a student on, um, remember that and, and make use of that as, as you move out into the world. And that's one of the reasons we're doing these. Thank you so much. Everyone have a wonderful night, stay safe and we'll see you soon, at least online. Thanks, thank you.